Introduction to Neural Networks with C-Sharp, Class 4, Part 4. Welcome to Part 4. In this part, we're going to examine the feedforward process. We will look at C-Sharp classes necessary to implement the feedforward process. The book provides several classes that can be used to implement feedforward neural networks in C-Sharp. In this class session, we will look inside of those classes and see how they're actually implemented. The feedforward process is basically a series of matrix operations, and we will examine exactly how that is done as well as the C-sharp code necessarily necessary to implement it. We will begin by looking at the feedforward process at a mathematical level. Here you see the equation that is used to calculate the output from a given neuron. The sigma notation states that we are summing from position 0 up to n minus 1. These are the weights that are associated between this neuron and all neurons that are feeding into it. We are only going up to n minus 1 because position n holds the threshold value. As you will recall from earlier class sessions, the threshold values and weights are stored in the same matrix. That's why weight sub n at the far right of the equation is added in at the last. Weight sub n, or w sub n, is the threshold value for this neuron. We sum the rest of the values up multiplied by the weights. The x is the inputs from the preceding layer of neurons, and w sub i is the weight between the output neuron and each of its input neurons. This equation can be simplified. If we drop the summation of the threshold at the end and loop from i0 to n instead of n minus 1, the equation looks like this. Here's the new equation. With some changes to the input data, we can use this equation. This equation now simply loops over all of the weight values. So it's going to loop over one additional value than what we would normally have for input values because the matrix has that threshold value that's one more than the input. So the problem is x sub i is the input, we're going to run out of values. If this loops from 0 to say 3 for 3 input values, it's going to loop over 4 values. It's going to expect 4 values in the input because it's going to need a fourth input value to multiply by the threshold value, which is the final value in that row of the, the weight matrix. So we need to modify the input just slightly so that it can work with this equation and we're able to calculate the output. Let's see how we would modify the input. Here we see that we have a four-columned matrix. This is how we would have modified the input data for the original input that just had three columns. The original input was 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3. The one is just a extra input that we add there. One multiplied by anything is where it started from. So the fourth value that's contained in the weight matrix, which is the threshold value, is simply going to be multiplied by 1 and added to the rest of the values. This causes the threshold value to simply be added like it was in the original equation, and this simplifies the equation. This also simplifies the source code. We can now accomplish this with a simple dot product. Now let's look at the code necessary to do this. The compute outputs method is provided by the neural network class that is provided in this book. Calling the compute outputs method is the main entry point into the neural network. You want to call this on the neural network class. You don't need to call this on the individual layers. This method actually calls the computation function for the individual layers and aggregates the output of the neural network up to a single output. You can see that the input is an input array of doubles. This should directly correspond to the number of input neurons you have. You can also see that it returns a double array. This is the output from the neural network. This should directly correspond to the number of output neurons that you have in the neural network. 
Looking inside of the compute outputs method, we can see what it's actually doing. We can see that it is going to loop over all of the feed forward layers that were provided to this neural network. For each layer, it needs to see how it's going to handle it. It's going to handle the input layers differently than the hidden layers. And then finally, it's going to return the output layers. First, let's look at what it does for the input layer. For the input layer, it simply calls the compute outputs method for the layer, and it continues on to the next layer. This allows the input layer to calculate what its output is going to be. The input layer is handled differently because it's where everything starts. For all of the hidden layers, null is passed in because the hidden layers will simply get their input from the preceding layer. The input layer has to start the whole thing. Now let's see what happens when we call the compute outputs for the individual feedforward layers. It has the same signature, compute outputs, as does the neural network class. The first thing that the layer compute outputs does that you see here is it checks the pattern. The pattern is the input pattern being passed. As you recall, we can pass a null input pattern to it. If the input pattern is not null, as you will recall from the slide we just looked at, that means that this is the input layer and we have passed some values in for that pattern array that the neural network needs to calculate for. To account for this, we set the fire, which is what this layer has fired, to the pattern that was passed in. This simulates as though we had received the input layer from a preceding layer, which really doesn't exist. It's the input layer. That's where it starts. The next thing that the compute outputs layer needs to do is create a special input matrix. Remember we said that the input matrix needs to have an additional value added onto the right of it, which is a one value. This is so that it can multiply against the threshold value and not modify the threshold value. We simply want the threshold value added with the other values. The create input matrix is a special function provided in the layer class. It, all it does is creates a new matrix that has one additional column from what it has passed, and it copies the pattern matrix that was passed into it to the first values of that new matrix, and then the final value, the far right value, it places a 1, and it returns this. So this prepares the input for the threshold. Now that the input has been prepared, we are ready to calculate the output that will be passed on to the next layer, or if this is the final output layer, this will be the output from the neural network. We are going to loop over all of the neurons, as you can see here. We are going to obtain a, the column from the weight matrix that corresponds to the neuron that we're calculating for. These are the weights between this neuron and all the neurons in the later layer. We're going to calculate the dot product, which is essentially a sum of two matrices multiplied by each other. We use the special input matrix that we created that has the 1 for the threshold value, and we set all of these values into the fire array. We, mul we pass everything into the activation function, which scales the output as we previously discussed. This multiplies all the weights and adds the threshold. Finally, we return the output from this layer. This is essentially just the fire array. As we did in the loop that we just looked at, it returns every single value that was calculated from the dot product. This concludes part four. In part five, you're gonna learn about the backpropagation algorithm and see how to actually implement it to train the neural networks that you can now evaluate using the code that was presented in this part. We hope you will continue with part five. Thank you. This course is based on our Introduction to Neural Network Programming books for Java and also Introduction to Neural Networks for C Sharp. Available in both paperback and ebook format.